this is a general presentation about rapidly changing issues. Nothing we say here should be construed as legal advice because obviously we're not considering the facts of your specific situation. If you have a particular situation on which you need advice, please reach out to Goodwin or any one of us. Um, and due to the scale of this event and to help its, in, its management, we have intentionally disabled the video um, and audio features for non-presenter panelists. Please use the Q&A feature to present questions. Please note that we are recording this session. It will be made available to you following the program. Um, and with that exciting introduction, I turn it over to, uh, to my colleague, Grant Fondo, talk about the next issues. Actually, before that though, an exciting video. You issued 24 million new shares of stock. You were told that if new investors How came much along, of your shares diluted? How much were his? What was Mr. Zuckerberg's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. What was Mr. Moskowitz's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. What was Sean Parker's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. What was Peter Thiel's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. And what was your ownership share diluted down to? 0.03%. You signed the papers. You set me up. You're going to blame me because you were the business head of the company and you made a bad business deal with your own company. It's going to be like I'm not a part of Facebook. It won't be like you're not a part of Facebook. You're not a part of Facebook. My name's on the masthead. You might want to check again. All right, so with that introduction, we thought we'd hit the, the first and maybe the most important issue with, with uh, starting companies. And that's the relationships between the founders and sort of how you deal with the unexpected. Um, super exciting, a bunch of people get together, they decide to develop you know, one or two or three people get together, decide to form a new company, change the world, um, make a lot of money hopefully. and. Uh, along the way, everything se everybody seems to be in sync, everyone's getting along. But the reality is like any relationship, whether it's business, romantic or otherwise, um, they break apart as you saw with, the, with that video slide, but also just what we see all the time is that founders end up just disagreeing, wanting to move on, having fights, um, and you have to sort of anticipate that. Nobody sort of like and think of it as like a prenuptial for founders. And so things you want to focus on is, you know, as soon as possible, make sure you paper the terms of the relationship. Uh, I would not do that via email. You know, find somebody, a lawyer who knows how to do it, and you set up the structure. Um, pretty straightforward. A lot of the issues are very similar. They've been dealt with 100 previous times. So seek that advice. Make sure that you paper it in the proper way. Because realistically, if you think about your founder group or your core group right now, and two, two or three years, most of them are not going to be there. Um, and they may not even remain friendly. And so you just want to deal with those circumstances and think those issues through in a fair and just manner before all those problems are, start. Once the problems start, it gets really hard to sort of reconfigure things. Another founder issue that we see a lot is the inability to make a decision. Um, sometimes things are just not working out right with a particular founder, and it can be very challenging, particularly if they're a friend or you've developed this relationship over time or you're confrontationally, you know, adverse to confrontation. It can be very hard to make certain decisions, even about firing a founder or changing their position. And that's the reality of life, unfortunately. This is a business, um, but not making a decision is oftentimes just a bad decision, and you're just prolonging the inevitable. We see it a lot. And what can also happen is over time, that founder is continuing to develop equity. Maybe they're slowing down the project. Um, they're not happy. They generally don't get happier over time. And it's better to sort of deal with the problem upfront in a mature way and sort of move on. 
The other thing you want to set for is what is everybody's obligations, not only sort of their roles within the company, but going forward over time. Do many founders have lots of different projects going on, um, either up here or actually in, in reality when they're putting um, companies together? And that can be OK. I think it's fine. But you want to make sure that everybody understands that and everybody understands their commitment to the project and their roles. If people, uh, if one of the founders is spending 25% of their time on some other project and it starts to creep to 50%, et cetera, that can cause tension. So you want to make sure that everybody understands that obligation and also understands that once that company is formed, it's really not their idea anymore. It's the company's idea. It's the company's property. And if that's not the case, you want to make sure that you address it up front. Um, sort of something that many people don't think about, but is a reality, um, particularly over time, is that many people end up having partners or spouses. And you are essentially, because your co-founder owns, let's just say, 50% of the company, that means effectively in California, their spouse may ultimately end up owning 25% of the company. And as you can imagine, if there is a contentious divorce with a founder, it creates a ton of potential problems for a company. So um, not the best topic to have with your co-founder who's in, you know, in a ha happily married at, the point, at that moment, but it is something you wanna think about, um, provisions that potentially deal with what happens in that situation. Uh, so that you don't deal with it after the fact because it's very challenging to, to deal with it after the fact. The other th mistake that we tend to see a lot is with advisors. Again, you have a lot, you're talking to a lot of people. There's some great people that you know in your particular industry and you want to bring them in on the project and there's a lot of value to that. But you want to be very thoughtful about what is bringing them into the project mean and you want to be very clear. You, if they're truly just an advisor and you want to get uh, make them an advisor, make it an advisor agreement, which is different than a board seat, different than a board advisor seat, and different than being an employee or co-founder. And you want to make those things very clear because if your co company succeeds and they think that they have a, they're entitled to more than you do, it can create, again, a lot of problems. Um, the other thing is make sure those advisor agreements sort of have to be renewed repeatedly, meaning like annually or something like that, rather than something that continues, because oftentimes the companies forget about certain advisors. And then two or three years later, suddenly you realize they've accumulated a lot of stock in your company. They also um, often don't contribute a lot, frankly. And so you really want to be consistently evaluating your advisors to see, are they really, are you really getting your the right bang for the buck? So just something to think about. Um, Big names can be really important to a project, but you want to think about their current value and then their long-term value as well. Next slide. Great. Thanks, Grant. Hey, everyone. I'm Jen Fisher. Excited to be here and uh, welcome any comments or uh, questions from, from the audience. Um, I'm going to cover some contract issues, which may not seem terribly exciting, but are very crucial to your business, how you interact with your customers, your vendors, your suppliers, sort of everyone in your startup's ecosystem. Um, eventually, those relationships will be, you know, confined to a contract in one way or another. So there's some key contract principles that, that everyone should kind of keep in mind um, as you're starting out and, and thinking through what kinds of relationships you're going to develop in your particular industry or with your business. Um, oftentimes, we recommend the development of a form contract, so a baseline that you can use um, for negotiations with your customers or your suppliers or your vendors, um, but is a form contract that you have, that you've drafted, that you've taken the pen on, um, and that can be a starting point for future negotiations, which oftentimes is really helpful um, for you know you to provide. Um, as you're entering or contemplating new contractual relationships. Um, and the key to developing that kind of good baseline form contract is really investing in the initial draft. Uh, we see a lot of contracts come across our desk that are cut and paste jobs or don't really cover all of the issues or circumstances that might arise in the contractual relationship. Um, so there's a lot of holes there. Um, and it's because 
you know, somebody maybe without the right experience or an eye towards spotting issues that could occur, kind of put together what they thought was a, a good enough initial draft. Um, and then that tends to just get copied and pasted and used over and over again. And it has the same kind of flaws in it that the original draft had. So investing in the initial draft of your key contracts is really important. Um, and hiring good counsel to help you do that will help you save money down the road um, when there are contractual disputes that arise or ambiguities in the contract lead to you know, disagreements with your the contracting party, parties that could have been avoided. So kind of smart to invest up front, make sure you have all your ducks in a row with your contracts, make sure they're well drafted and that you've contemplated a lot of the different types of issues you know, that you would expect and even trying to think through some unforeseen circumstances that you can cover in a contract will save you lots of money, time and heartache down the road because contractual disputes are no fun for anybody. Um, so on that note, you know, keep your, your basic terms really clear and, un, and unambiguous. So both parties to the contract have a really great understanding of what they're agreeing to in terms of, you know, deliverables, who's being expected to perform under the contract, what are they expected to do, when are they expected to deliver, um, all of those things getting getting those things set forth really clearly in the contract will um, get just you know create a roadmap for this relationship and set expectations for both parties. Um, another one is pricing. That's going to be a business term you're going to be negotiating, but it should be pretty clearly spelled out in the contract that the parties have come to a mutual agreement on pricing and it's reflected in the contract. Um, similar to pricing, um, the method in terms and timing of payment. So if a per performance is executed under the contract, if you do what you say you're going to do, um, how do you get paid um, and when and under what terms and how does that process work? Um, and what happens if there's a late payment? Are there penalties attached to a late payment? Um, so really setting forth the terms and the process that you're going to use to get paid or to pay others by virtue of these these contracts is 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 really key. Um, and then and then termination rights, kind of similar to Grant's point about not wanting to start a relationship already, thinking about the divorce. But it's really important to think about while this seems like a really great contractual relationship now, or we're selling our services to this group, or we're buying from them, um, or we're partnering together, and everyone's really excited about the prospects of that relationship, um, it's really key to think about what happens when you might no, not want to be in that contractual relationship with that party anymore, or you don't want to you want other options. You found a better option. You want to get out of the contract and enter into a new contract with someone else. Clearly spelling out how the contract can be terminated, under what circumstances, um, and whether notice needs to be provided. And if so, who does that notice go to? Kind of thinking through at the beginning of the relationship, how you might end the relationship really clears up a lot of the di disputes we see. A lot of it is around, you know, there not being clear enough obligations around termination. And usually the party who's terminating the contract wants to get a really quick exit and the other party cries flat, foul. So if both parties can agree in advance on how to end the relationship um, in a way that provides adequate notice and a clean exit, that's always going to be to your advantage. So termination rights, pretty pretty key. Um, and then those are kind of business terms you can think about. And then there's also the legal protections you'll want to put in place. Um, limitations of liability, making sure that if something goes wrong, you have some legal protections in place, and the expectations around that are really set up front. Um, another one is force majeure 
clauses, what happens when something totally outside of the control of the parties occurs that impacts either or both parties' ability to perform under the contract. Um, at just around this time last year, March, April, May, June, we were dealing with a lot of those issues because of the pandemic um, and the disruption to many businesses that the pandemic caused. Um, and, and a lot of um, companies weren't unable to fulfill their obligations because they had been shut down or didn't have access to their employees and um, you know the supply chain broke down. Um, so having um, clauses in your contract that provide an out for those types of circumstances are also uh, important. And then dispute resolution. Um, you know we by the time uh, these matters usually come to you know us, Grant, Dave, and I are looking at what went wrong and how do we try to fix it, um, and where do we go to try and get relief? Either if we want to you know enforce the terms of the contract because the other party breached, or defend a party being accused of a breach. Where does that happen? Um, and the terms of the contract are the first place that we look. Um, so have the parties agreed to bring their claims to court? And if so, in what jurisdiction, what city, what state? Um, is there a choice of law provision that they've thought through? Or have they chosen arbitration? You know, we, we've, we find that a lot of our clients do opt to have an arbitration clause included in their contracts. For lots of reasons, it can be cheaper and faster than litigating in court, um, and it can also be kept confidential. So that's a consideration to kind of keep in mind um, as you're going through your contracts and um, you know thinking through if something went wrong and we wanted to pursue our rights under this contract, what's the most advantageous way for us to do that? Um, and that, that should be spelled out pretty clearly um, in the contract itself. So those are some issues around contracts. And um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about, it's it's related in some ways, but the terms of use and privacy policies on your websites, because in essence, these are contracts with anyone who's accessing your site, anyone who's coming on and using your website, either to review the content or sign up for a subscription service or buy products from you. Um, the terms of use really establish the parameters of the relationship that you're building with the people that are accessing your website. So terms and conditions on a website are legally binding. Um, they can really serve to your benefit. They can prevent users of your site from abusing or misusing the service. Um, they as a general matter, tend to you know lay out the guidelines of of how your service can be used, and what happens if those guidelines aren't followed. Um, and you know, as a general matter, you also want to make sure you're owning your content. You know, the content that you're providing on your site is yours. You're putting on them on notice that it's yours. Um, you want to protect it. You don't want it to be stolen or misused. And so terms and conditions are really the place where you can convey a lot of those principles and kind of protect what you're offering on your site. So we, we do see a lot of startups that cut and paste terms of use and terms and conditions from other um, websites. And there are a lot of standard terms and conditions out there. That being said, the most effective terms that are that can be used to protect your business are the ones that are very much tailored to your business, what you're offering, what's on the site, um, and how your business works. So the more customized it can be, the more protection you'll get. Um, the purpose of the terms of use is really to inform users of how the site can be used, including limitations on that use. So they tend to be pretty long and involved and have lots of legalese, um, unfortunately, but the best ones that, that we work on with our clients are, are terms that provide all the protections you need, but in a way that's easily understandable and communicates the key principles to any user who's visiting that site so they understand what the kind of guardrails are. 
um, in, in that, you know, in from your perspective as the site operator, you want to include all appropriate disclaimers. Um, and if you're offering a product um, on the website, you want this is where you can, you know, really um, identify your whether there is a right to a refund, how returns work, um, if there is a subscription or auto renewal um, offering, you can, this is where you would want to really spell that out, um, explain the rules of how those programs work, um, how they can be terminated, um, and when the, for for an auto renewal or subscription service when the customer will continue to be charged. You want to put them on notice of all of those terms um, so that when they agree to it, they're bound by those terms. Um, again, kind of more on the legal protection side, you want to make sure there's limitations of liability in your terms and conditions um, and an indemnification provision so that if they don't comply with the way that you defined the appropriate use of the services that that you are legally protected in those circumstances, and then it, identifying what's yours on the site. If there's trademarks, copyrighted material, those belong to you. Um, this is where you would want to identify what those are um, and establish that you know that 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 um, information can't be taken or used or um, copied in any other way. Um, and a key piece of kind of coming up with your terms of service is understanding your customer journey. How do they make their way through your site? How do they access your services? Um, and along the way, what information about them is being collected and used? Um, and that kind of a, a good transition into privacy policies, which are very, very important especially in this moment that we're living in where a lot of consumers are very concerned about their privacy and um, a lot of companies are getting requests from consumers about how their information is used um, and stored and whether it's being sold. Um, there's a heightened awareness around um, consumer privacy. So it's a really good idea to make sure your privacy policy is totally buttoned up um, and really you know, spells out um, you know, what information is being collected. So if it's your credit cards, addresses, in some cases, you know, names and ages, um, it, this, is, this is where you can explain to your users of your site how that information is used, where it's stored, how it's stored, and then how it's protected, how the confidentiality of that information is protected. Um, for certain of your companies, you may want you may want to include warnings around um, visitors. Um, if if you have an understanding that children might be accessing your site, this is where you want to put a warning in there. Um, and then, depending on what service you're marketing or offering through the site, you may need to think about how to put an age gating mechanism in place. Um, as a part of the intro, um, I do, you know, co-lead our cannabis practice at Goodwin. Um, and so we we obviously, age gating is super important for that industry. And so we work with our clients all the time to make sure that their websites are age gated appropriately. So the content can't be accessed by um, people that are under 18 in certain jurisdictions and under 21 in others. Um, and then, this is where also you might explain how the site could be accessed through through party services like Twitter or Facebook. Um, and then again, just letting people know what steps you're taking as a company to make sure that their um, confidential information is secure um, and, um, and protected from disclosure. And then just you, these are two, these are two types of policies, kind of like what Grant said with working with advisors, you kind of want to keep reviewing them and annually, there might be changes in your business, there might be changes to the way you process information or store it. And so you want to make sure your terms of use and privacy policies are up to date and reflective of how your company is operating. Hello again, everybody. I'm Dave Calloway, and I want to talk briefly with you about 
when you're thinking about what platforms you're going to set up in your business, you should, of course, be thinking about what platforms best enable your business to thrive and what is what's the most convenient um, for connecting your folks. But you should also be thinking about what you might have to do in the case of litigation and if document preservation should become an issue, think about in advance how you would organize yourselves to make sure that you're able to preserve and produce those communications if you should have to. Email's easy. Everybody um, is familiar with that and has done it and is, is aware of how it works. Slack, Telegram, Signal are, are different, um, in some cases much more difficult, and it's just something you should be thinking about as you're setting things up at the beginning. It's important to develop a document preservation strategy and then maintain it, have it available to you, understand how it works, and um, if necessary, be prepared to deploy it immediately so that you can't be accused of having allowed messages that were relevant to a claim or to litigation to slip away. And you should assume, and you should teach your employees and make this a regular part of your training that all messages made down the road have to be shared with a disgruntled employee, an unhappy customer, um, or a government regulator or prosecutor. It is something that we, you know, Jen Grant and I and, and folks who do what we do regularly encounter where folks just can't believe that a Slack channel in which people are gossiping, they're criticizing competitors, they're talking about people within the company, that all of that suddenly becomes grist for the litigation production mill and people are shocked and dismayed, don't know how to grab the stuff, can't believe they have to turn the stuff over. And it is just something for you to think about at the front end and not when this hits you like a wet fish, fish slapped across your face that you're thinking about for the first time two years in. This last bullet is something to think about, not everybody can do it. It's, it's not always practical, but in a perfect world, you don't mix your personal devices with work devices. Again, when productions happen, when you're gathering information for a subpoena, people don't like the fact that suddenly they're, the text messages they've been sharing with their wives, um, or to go to Grant's earlier point, mistresses, are suddenly mixed in with uh, work communications that do need to be produced. That's an uncomfortable conversation to have that could be avoided if you set things up differently um, from the get-go. So communications, always important to think about at the front end and to think about not just in terms of your convenience, but also in terms of both the security of your communications and the necessity and ability to produce them if you have to. Yeah, if I, Dave, if I could just jump in on there too. Um, so it is amazing the amount of messaging that companies do now and the cost of producing that is, is incredible. And the regulators more and more just want to see it all. And they have a lot of leverage when they ask you those questions. So I, I would encourage you just go back and look at your Slack communications over the last week or two weeks and see if there's anything in there. You're like, boy, I really would not want anyone to see that. Um, there are, you know, when we, I got involved in this space 20, 25 years ago, it was emails, right? And we would look for stupid emails. Well, now we have created all these opportunities for other stupid comments. And Slack and Telegram and Signal are great um, examples of that. Signal, I know, has certain confidentiality and, and um, you know, doesn't, doesn't get preserved like Slack and Telegram do. But um, it cannot emphasize this enough. Be very, very thoughtful. Um, and that includes like coworkers, you know, um, not the best venue to be criticizing coworkers during a meeting um, because that may end up getting produced at a later date and it can be kind of embarrassing, frankly. Um, likewise, spouses um, don't want to do that. I, as a prosecutor, I used a, a text message um, against a defendant 
um, because he was making a critical comment about one of his family members. And it was just a lot of fun to use that. So, so be very thoughtful about what you're doing it, doing, um, and, uh, expect inevitably you will have to produce some of that stuff. All right. What I wanted to cover, um, is some offshore issues. So I, um, as mentioned before, I'm a founder and co-chair of our blockchain and digital currency group. And in particularly in the digital currency space, there's a lot of discussions about offshore issues. Should we be offshore because the U.S. regulatory environment is uncertain or less friendly than places like Malta uh, and, and elsewhere? So um, there's a lot of sort of considerations that go into that. Tax is clearly, clearly one of them. A lot of people go to Cayman Islands, for example, or BVI for tax reasons. But I want to talk more about sort of the regulatory business aspects of that. So it can be very you know, appealing to say, we'll set up something offshore so nobody can bother us. But you're not offshore just because you opened up a P.O. box in the Cayman Islands or the Seashells or Malta or Panama, and you're sitting here in the U.S. doing your thing. So offshore means truly offshore. That means all your employees are offshore. All your contractors are off offshore. You are offshore. Your servers are offshore and you're not marketing to the U.S. Um, that's a that's a really hard bar to jump. And there's obviously degrees. Um, if you have most of your stuff offshore, makes it a little bit harder to get sued, makes it a little bit harder to have regulatory issues. But it's not an absolute bar. So as you're thinking about the offshore issues, really try to understand what are you getting by moving offshore? Is it really benefiting you as much as you hope it will? And it may, but you just want to think through it. Another issue is that a lot of companies have independent contractors all over the world. And that's awesome. There's a lot of technical skills out there and there's a lot of, you know, frankly, cheaper labor offshore than onshore. Problem with that is um, really hard to get to those people. So you hire somebody from Ukraine and they steal your technology. Good luck getting them. FBI is not going to return that phone call. They're, you know, they got bigger problems to, to go after. Um, you're not going to be able to sue them. And that's kind of across the board with most countries. European countries are a little bit easier, but it's still a major hassle. Also, there are different laws that apply. So while you may have a great case in the U.S., um, having that, trying to go after that person in um, some other jurisdiction can be a real pain. So um, just things to think about. One last thing is geofencing. So there's, if you are, there may be countries that you want to avoid either having customers with because it creates regulatory issues you're not ready to deal with. Most of the time it's with the U.S. where you create an enemy, but you geofence to prevent U.S. users. You want to make sure it's a robust practice and you want to make sure a robust system that you have. And you want to make sure that you're checking it to make sure that it actually works. And you absolutely Absolutely do not want to set up a system that is not designed to be penetrated. So you put it up kind of as window dressing, but you don't care and you let people come in and out. That's actually worse than just not doing it. So just be thoughtful about the offshore issues. There's some really you know, great benefits about offshore for um, regulatory reasons, tax reasons, economics, but it's something to be very thoughtful about as you do, th do that process. I think we're all going to be weighing in on regulatory considerations, but I will kick it off. And I would start by saying that as you develop your business plan, think about the regulatory oversight that you would be subjecting yourself to. The simpler you can keep it, the better. You don't want to bite off more regulators than you can chew. If you end up in a situation where you're being regulated by the, you know, CFTC or and the SEC and the it, you 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 can end up in situations where there are um, overlapping sometimes even conflicting regulatory strictures that are governing you and if you can avoid that by being thoughtful at the front end about what it is you're actually doing and who would regulate it um, that is is always a good way to start. Copying a dumb idea does not turn that dumb idea into a good idea. Um, frequently people will see something and they think, oh, we can do that. Um, and they've, they've, without thinking about it, thinking it's okay because somebody else is already doing it, they've put themselves into regulatory hot water that they did not anticipate. 
um, Jen and I and Grant, actually all three of us re uh, recently counseled a prospective client on exactly that issue involving the cryptocurrency space where what they were proposing to do essentially was advertising on their website that they were going to engage in market manipulation. Um, and they thought it was totally fine because they'd seen somebody else doing it. So it's something to just be very, very careful about. Don't assume whatever it is that you ultimately decide to, to launch. Don't assume that using independent contractors to perform some or all components of your business plan insulates you from potential liability for what they do. If it's your business and they're your contractors, it's your responsibility, even if they are not technically employees. Um, ask yourselves and if appropriate, consult with, with smart lawyers to make sure you've obtained all the state and local business permits that you need to conduct your business. Uh, many people launch in and find out six months in, a year in, that they are lacking a key permit and that a regulator that they were not expecting to have to interact with suddenly has the ability to completely shut down their business. Similarly, you want to um, look at whether there are any industry specific permits or licenses that you need to engage in in your business. Similar, and by the same token, are there any zoning or conditional use permits that you need to operate in a particular area? How are you handling, handling sales tax licenses or permits? Do you have your federal and state employer ID? Something as basic as that, people will sometimes launch without thinking that all the way through. Um, certain practices are separately regulated under state and federal law and sometimes differently regulated under state and federal law. Lotteries, gambling, subscription services, um, insurance, all fall into that category potentially. If you are the sort of business that is going to be taking custody of people's money, transmitting people's money, or just um, receiving it on behalf of customers, you need to be aware of anti-money laundering requirements, know your customer requirements with both, which both uh, Grant and Jan, oh, Jan alluded to earlier, and also OFAC, screening your clients to make sure that you are not inadvertently dealing with somebody who's on a restricted entity list, somebody that you're, permit, you're prohibited by federal law from um, engaging in any sort of business with. You need to have those screening mechanisms in place to make sure that those folks don't inadvertently come onto your platform and do prohibited business with you. Um, there are some higher risk areas, of course, that include cannabis, digital currency, lending and payments, as we just discussed. And I will um, step back and let Jen and Grant talk a little bit more about that because that is definitely their area. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, so I, about five years ago, I started focusing a lot of my practice on serving clients in the cannabis industry. Um, and essentially, because it was such a nascent industry, all of them were startups in, in one way or another. Um, and we, we work with clients in lots of different aspects. Of course, um, we have clients that operate throughout the sort of cannabis supply chain. Um, but we're starting to see more and more tech companies focused on can, the cannabis industry and how they can come up with solutions that can make you know, the process of getting cannabis from the seed to the sale is more simple, um, easier, easier to track, um, information and research gathering around consumer trends in the space. Um, there's just really a kind of endless opportunities for innovation because it's a brand new industry um, that has been around for a long time for those of us, you know, in California, but has really become more professionalized since 2018 when it, uh, cannabis was legalized for adult use in California. And a lot of the other Western states are, are with us in terms of 
um, had the maturity of some of the companies operating in these states, but in many other parts of the country, including on the East Coast and the Mid-Atlantic region, and even now we're seeing in the Midwest and the South that are expanding legalization, these are brand new industries that are being developed from the ground up. And so there's lots of opportunity um, for startup companies to come in and identify needs um, that licensed operators may have to help them make their business in their you know, more efficient and generate more revenue. And that's all really, really exciting. Um, but there's lots of regulatory considerations to, to keep in mind. Um, cannabis is in particular is a highly regulated industry. It also is still prohibited under federal law. So there's lots of complexities there. And federal law has a lot of additional implications. Um, for companies operating in this state, in this space beyond just marijuana as a controlled substance under the CSA, um, there's lots of other aspects that um, of cannabis businesses that touch other federal laws, including a lot of the banking and anti-money laundering, um, uh, you know, codes under federal law that can that can cause a lot of headache for operators in the space and their ancillary service providers. So companies that are not touching the plant, as we say, but are in otherwise involved in the industry and um, receiving funds that were generated from the sale of cannabis. Um, and then at the state level, in states that have legalized cannabis, for example, um, each state has their own regulatory framework um, and they're all different. <laughs> so it's it's pretty complex, especially for those companies that have decided to operate in multiple states or service providers that want to take their technology, their platform and offer it to, to companies that are operating in multiple states. Keeping in mind all of the sort of regulatory barriers and obligations, both on the disclosure front and the, on the compliance front, are all super important, but it's still a really exciting time to be in that space. Lots of innovation occurring um, and um, really a, a high trajectory of growth expected in the next five years. Thanks, Jen. So I'll just quickly uh, add a few points. So um, in the, the blockchain space and a lot of this applies for the payment spaces too, but, but in the blockchain and digital currency space, um, it's really a regulatory minefield. Um, there are every, there's regulators fighting over who, what aspects of this space that they are um, ability, have the ability to go after, and they and it, the area is still very uncertain. What I will say, and this applies to any business that you are doing, um, you want to look through and, may, and test your assumptions. So many clients come to us and say, "Well, we're a software company, so we don't we don't actually are are regulated." Most of the time, that's not totally true. You are partially a software part company, but you're also partially somebody that is regulated. Likewise, the current trend here is um, we're decentralized. Uh, you may think you're decentralized. Most regulators don't think you are. And when we sort of kick the tires a little bit, most of the time you really aren't decentralized. So those are just some of the areas that you really need to focus on. Um, but every business, as you sit down and put it, you're putting your business and as it's growing, you really want to think about, are we going into a minefield? And today's earlier, my idea. There are a lot of in a lot of these industries, you see someone else doing it and they don't seem to be regulated. They didn't get licensed. And so you assume that it's OK. Um, oftentimes, they just haven't been taken down yet. Um, you know, and listen, it's a little bit of a herd mentality in a sense. Will a regulator get, you know, one of the bison? Bison, will they get 10 of them? We don't know. But um, just because it hasn't been taken down yet doesn't mean that it's um, operating fully compliant. And kind of the last topic I think we wanted to cover today was just social messaging. Um, in this environment that we're living in, how you get the word out about your company takes many different shapes um, and it's constantly evolving. There's new ways of marketing your business and reaching consumers or partners. Um, and a lot of that has to do with social messaging. So using social media platforms in one way or another to kind of get the word out about your company in addition to more traditional forms of marketing. And so just keeping that in mind, it's really important to still maintain some level of control over the messaging and the statements that you're making about your company 
about the products or services that you're offering to consumers um, and how those messages are made. A lot of times um, companies hire social media influencers, for example, um, and thinking and without realizing that to, if there's something in, given to them in exchange for them promoting your product, that you're liable for what they say about your product. So make sure the way you're marketing your company and messaging your company, both in terms of on the product side and also with potential investors on the side of, you know, describing the financial state of your company, that you're not making any false statements. Um, and to that end, you're also not over exaggerating how the products work um, or the success of your company. All of those types of exaggerations or false or misleading statements can really come back to bite you um, and are not worth making <laughs> when you think about all the trouble that they can they can cause. And so it's just important to keep in mind that you want to control your message throughout all of the different channels um, that you're using to promote your company, either with potential investors or with partners or with your consumer base. Um, so just kind of keep it in mind from a really holistic perspective and make sure that you have control over the message and that um, the statements you're putting out are, are not false and misleading or over-exaggerated. To what Jen said, um, before we direct you to some other um, programs you should pay attention to, on the exaggerating your claims, one thing that's very important is that you don't outsource the marketing, or if you do outsource the marketing, that you pay attention to what the people you outsourced it to are doing. Is companies frequently will go to uh, an SEO optimizer and they will delegate to them getting their profile elevated and then they'll find out for example in the cbd space that the way that um that marketer did so was by just cutting and pasting all kinds of wildly false claims about the health benefits of this particular substance and then the ftc comes calling and it's no help then to say oh well that wasn't really us we outsourced it to these people and as soon as we found out what they had done we fired them well, that's good, but not nearly good enough. So um, very important message there. Um, and then to our last slide, some things we didn't talk about that are also very important are gonna be covered in other sessions. Employment and IP issues, please tune in for Rachel Walsh and Karai Balut, Thursday, June 10th. Um, they will be talking about that at the same bat time and same bat channel. So, um, Thank you very much. I guess we left a little bit of, of time and room for questions. Yes. Gosh, I'm, I, all this is really interesting to hear because there are, I think, a lot of companies and founders who don't follow a lot of these rules. And so it's really helpful to know, especially for a lot of our early stage founders who are just getting started to implement these practices early on so you don't get really far ahead of yourselves and have to clean up after some of these things. Um, okay, first question. For a startup selling service on the web with a B2C model, what is like the must legal work required to do before launching the service and letting users consume the product? What are some of those must haves? Well, I think um, this is a great question, and I, I think we hit on it somewhat, but I just to re-emphasize, I, um, I think having a really solid locked down terms of service, terms and conditions, terms of service, terms of use, there's lots of different ways to describe it, but it's basically a contract between you and your users, your consumers, your the, the people visiting your site, um, the consumers that, that you're trying to attract. It really sets the boundaries around how they can use the site. Um, if they're making purchases on the site, what, gov what rules govern those purchases. Um, so terms of use and privacy policies are incredibly important to get up and done right right as you launch. Um, they can always be adjusted. We are tinkering with our clients' um, policies all the time as their business changes or regulations change, or we want to include additional protections we may not have thought about before. So they can be living documents on your website, but they, the first time you put them up, they should be really solid and 
you want to invest in that process and make sure that you're describing the terms and, you know, sort of how data is being collected in a way that actually matches what you're doing. I would, the other thing I would say is have a customer service process set up so that when you get the inevitable complaints, you deal with it. Um, we get calls every day about somebody wanting to sue somebody in the crypto space because they can't access their assets, et cetera. So have that system in place, deal with it, um, and be responsive as possible. And that tends to minimize future problems. That's helpful. Thank you. Some questions about the, the messaging and what can be used against you and all those things. Um, there, there's a few questions here. So one about with Slack messages that you can delete Slack messages, is that like, how do you deal with that if, if people can delete their messages? Can that still be used against you? And then a more kind of specific question about um, someone who used to work somewhere where they had an automated system to delete emails monthly to avoid getting wrapped up in potential litigation. They understood that any discovery was limited to those items within the email system. If emails were deleted and cannot be produced, they couldn't be used is this no longer an effective strategy to avoid producing historical emails? Poof. <laughs> well, there's a lot, there's a lot in that. But yeah. I, I would say that there are really two answers to that. They're not entirely um, consonant with one another, which on one hand, the, the platform is what it is. If you set it up to where there's a retention of only 30 days, then when you get a preservation request, then you lock it down at that point and you, th there will not be any messages from the 31st day and, and beyond. And that's fine, except that your policies themselves and the platform you choose can also be used against you if it can be argued um, and or proved that the reason you chose it is because you were engaging in some nefarious activity and you deliberately set up a system that would not be able to be um, you know, fully produced and disclosed. So what you do can be turned into an argument against you. It's not necessarily always going to be a persuasive argument, but if you have a disgruntled employee slash whistleblower who says, by the way, we're doing X, Y, and Z, and we specifically set up and discussed in the boardroom that we would delete all of our messages daily um, and have them disappear off the platform so this could never be proved, then if you have the sort of system where they disappear off the platform, that's going to be used against you. The other thing I would say is just because they're deleted doesn't mean it doesn't exist and can't be found on somebody's yeah. laptop or at Google. You can delete your emails, but Google may still have them. So um, so if they find them, they will be used against you. What's and then this? you've got the worst of both worlds, right? You tried to delete it and failed. Yeah. What's the solution here, though? Is it more like just verbal conversations so nothing can be held against you? Like, it seems like nothing is safe at this point if you know text messages and all these apps can be searched what do you guys suggest there for something that might be potentially risky just be thoughtful like you got to run your business and yeah. sometimes those emails may be very helpful you know you 10 times you warn that employee not to do something stupid but just just be very thoughtful about it particularly management um and that's probably the best advice we can give and like dave said earlier have a document or retention policy and adhere to it. And I think, I mean, sometimes it's hard to enforce these. I mean, the three of us have been involved in lots of cases that turned on a really bad email or message or, you know. Um, but I think also as your company grows and you bring more employees on, just a very simple, high level, um, you know, training session with them about what to how to conduct themselves on these messaging platforms and over email and encourage them to keep in mind if you don't want this if you don't want the message being shown in a courtroom to a jury or in front of the eyes of a regulator just think twice before you send it yeah. um, and that usually just putting that thought into the minds of employees who may not otherwise appreciate that can go a long way towards avoiding a lot of these problems not all of them for sure but just planting that seed 
um, as you're onboarding new employees can be really helpful. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think let's wrap it up there with the final statement to be thoughtful and communicate well and train your employees so that you can avoid having these issues down the road. Thank you so much. Dave, Grant, and Jen, it was wonderful having you. And as a reminder, again, we'll be back here, same place at 10 a.m. Pacific time for our final session. Thanks again to you all for being here.